Thanks. Um, I sometimes feel like that intro is written by my mother. It's like <laughs> long-winded and, you know, I'm not really like that. Um, I'm going to speak to you about risk and ransomware. And I know you've heard about ransomware all day. So I'm going to really do my best to stretch your brain and show you a different way of looking at ransomware. And I'm also going to leave you with some hope. Um, Brian likes to give me impossible tasks, like keeping Irish people from their pints. Um, and, and the other thing that you know, he wanted to do was, was leave you with hope. So it's my job to make ransomware look hopeful and also show you a lot of maths, economics, statistics about ransomware and still keep it fresh and interesting after a full day of amazing talks. Like I, I love this lineup. I was actually super intimidated to come here and speak in front of um, all the people who spoke before me. But um, I'm going to talk to you about adversarial risk in the age of ransomware, right? So without further ado. Um, people, you know, a lot of you think of risk, you think boring, you think nerds sitting down, writing equations, thinking about maths. Sometimes I do that stuff. I also think it's really exciting. Um, I hated risk when I was younger, which is why I do it now that I'm older. Um, but the reason I hated it was it was captured by compliance, right? And then I discovered adversarial risk mathematics. And people say like, oh, you can't calculate the risk of someone hacking something because they'll change their approach and they'll do this. You can. Counterfactuals, right? There's this beautiful um, set of techniques that you can use for this stuff. So what I want to do is give you a bit of historical perspective. Adversarial risk is not new. Here's, here's examples, right? So burglary, pickpockets, fraud, con artists, kidnap, ransom, piracy, livestock theft, cowboys, right? Um, vehicle theft, duels. I love this paper in computer science, right? Statistics of deadly quarrels. People have done statistics on, on duels, people sword fighting with pistols and so on. So adversarial risk mathematics has been around for a long time and you can go and study it a little bit more if you'd like to. Um, so, one of the things I needed to do to keep ransomware interesting and fresh is make it historical, right? Capture all the, the history. So I'm not going to talk about ransomware in the small. I'm not going to talk about individual incidents. I'm going to talk to you about an entire decade of ransomware. And then the way I want to stretch your brain is I want you to think about risk from more than one perspective at the same time, okay? What I want to do is invoke Dan Gear, who's wonderful, genius, and once said, or many times said, risk to whom? Risk is not the same to all of us. We experience different risks. It's subjective. Some of the things that happen to you don't happen to me and vice versa. And one of the things we always talk about is the risks here on the, on the, uh, I guess your left, left hand side, risk of intrusion. So this is like the victim's point of view, right? There's a risk that I've had an intrusion. There's a risk of lateral movement, et cetera. I won't read this out. You're smart people. You can read it yourself. What I want you to do is think about the risks on the other side, the risk to the threat actor. Their binaries don't work. They're not able to do the lateral movement. They're not able to get a ransom paid. They're not able to cash out the money. They're not able to launder the money, right? I want you to think about that as we go through the rest of this talk. And I'm going to show you a lot of data and really push the limits of what I think you can handle. I like to speak to an audience as if they are the smartest people I've ever met and really push it. So get your thinking caps on, okay? So risk to whom? Think about these two types of risks. And the main thing is become adversaries to our adversaries. Stop just waiting around for this problem to get solved, okay? This is a talk developed by a number of people. I can't do these talks myself. Um, I like to think that I'm the second best hacker that uh, Brian invited to do this talk. Um, the first best is there on the bottom right. Um, that's my friend Erin Burns. He did actually invite her to do the talk, um, but she had to stay in the UK for various reasons and was not able to do so. So I hope she comes back again. I mean, you might recognize some of the other people. They're Trend Micro people. So a lot of this came from a paper that's going to come out very shortly in a collaboration that we did with Trend Micro. So I just, I just want to thank them because a lot of the, the content you're going to see was built as a team. And I think it's a team sport. We got to do that. So. Ransomware over a decade. So this is a graph that I love to use. This is ransoms paid. It's a decade of ransoms paid. So I've been collecting Bitcoin addresses. Cambridge is a small town. I live there. There's not much to do in the evening. So I collect Bitcoin addresses, right? Don't you? Bitcoin cash. Um, so I've got something like, um, I'm trying to remember now. I can't even remember. 140,000 addresses or something. And it leads to this number of incidents. So of that, we have all these transactions. Each one of these is a ransom paid. It's a person. It's a business. It's something that happened. And the amounts of money are so large, I have to use a log scale on the left-hand side right? I can't just scale it in a single uh, number. So 10 to the 7, that's uh, what tens of millions. And then down below, you have some micro ransoms. That's actually probably us doing forensics transactions, but that's another story. Um, so this is what a decade of ransomware looks like in terms of payments alone. But the other thing that I want to tell you is not everyone pays the ransom. You know that. So the victim pool is not just what you see here. It's maybe 10 times bigger than this. 
And those people have suffered some costs as well, and we're going to keep thinking about it. So this is a long game now. We need a better strategy. It's not an emergency. It's not a newspaper article. We're not going to run around with our hair on fire and feel like heroes. We're going to work on this as a big problem over, over time. Many of you know this. You actually probably have already seen the slide today, so I'll keep it really brief. Ransomware has had these transitions over time from small individual ransomware incidents that targeted individual people and elicited small ransoms in the $10 or $100 kind of range. And then it kind of got a bit more serious and things scaled and we had cryptocurrencies and everything got bigger and it scaled globally. And now we've got these multi-million dollar ransoms, sometimes $100 million ransoms showing up in the news and in the press. Okay, so... There's been an evolution over that decade, and we can pay attention to that. I'm going to show that to you again in another slide. But before I get there, I want you to think about risk, right? It's frequency and severity. It's not just these big ransoms. There's a frequency of how often the, the problem occurs, and there's a severity of how bad it is to individual people. So I'm going to show you two graphs. I'm going to show you both at the same time. On the left-hand side is the frequency count of the ransoms I just showed you in the previous thing. So peak ransomware frequency was in 2014. Remember I told you I was going to tell you hopeful things. The most victims we ever had in a single year for ransomware from this data set, as far as I can tell, was back in 2014. So something good is already happening. But on the other graph, that is the amount of money. So they are hitting less people for more money. And they're making far, far, far more money these days than they were in the old days. So that's the graph on the right. And this is what happens when we share data. So again, trying to work on the hope, make sure you share this data. But we've already survived peak frequency of ransomware, at least in the historical view. Maybe, maybe bad things are coming, but let's stay hopeful. All right, ransomware severity varies by family. We talk about it as if it's a uniform, homogenous risk. This is the amount of money in variance from each of these different groups. So the good news is, if you get hit by ransomware, maybe you won't get hit by one of the really dangerous groups that charges you lots of money. You might get hit by one of the little ones. Deadbolt is one of my, my favorites at the moment. They charge about three grand a pop, right? And their tactic techniques, you know, they're not that hard. You can really handle this stuff. So ransomware is painted as this big, scary threat that's always super bad, but actually most of the times, it's really not that bad. So there's a very strong correlation with who the family is that you were targeted by and the size of the ransom. There's also a correlation with the size of your business. They, you know that they ask you for a ransom based on the size of your company. Which one of those two correlations is stronger? I haven't worked out yet, um, but I am working on it, right? So this is ransomware detection frequency, which also varies by family. So what I want to get across to you is that you can't just talk about ransomware risk homogeneously. You have to think about each individual family because it's different, okay? So I know a lot of people who do mathematical modeling of ransomware. One of the things they do wrong is they model it as one big monolithic risk that's IID, and it's not. Okay. This is distributions of individual ransoms, and this is where it's going to get super interesting for anyone who actually does incident response. Um, Different groups have different distributions of severity, right? They charge different amounts of money. They make different amounts of money. There's a whole willingness to pay equation that's going on. What can I do with this data? And in particular, that deadbolt one is really interesting. You see how there's like this straight line of, of uh, prices across the top and straight line across the bottom. That's really fascinating. That tells me they're making the money on the top line. That's what they're actually charging. And then they're eliciting or sending out very, very small amount of money transactions, which is the bottom line. And that is the key to decrypt in a blockchain transaction, right? So they've solved the problem of distributing the keys for decryption without ever having to negotiate with you. And they do that in that way. And so you can see that in the data. So what does this mean? Distributions have a distance from each other. Some of you will be familiar with TLSAH or SSD, you know, binary distance. The distance from this binary to this binary. Guess what? You can also do that with statistical distributions. So this is the Wasserstein distance from this. Why am I talking about this crazy, you know, economics, Wasserstein distance stuff? Because you can turn it into a probability that that gang has the same distribution as that gang. Now that might be a victim effect or that might be a prey or predator effect, right? And we have to think about that. Is that because they're targeting the same victims and the same victims are paying the same amounts of money? Or is it because they're using some sort of tactic that allows them to negotiate a better ransom? Either way, it gives me a probability that these two gangs are the same or similar, at least in terms of severity. Everybody with me? No, you're ready to drink. You're like, too much maths, and there's a heat map, and I want to go home. That's all right. That's fine. Never show them this graph again. All right. Um, 
You can also do this with frequency. You don't just do it with severity. You can do it with frequency. So this is the frequency of victim counts. And you can see this has different patterns, right? You can literally see from the mathematics whether this is an affiliate program that's hitting individual people or whether it's like a spray and pay and then a decay in the amount of ransoms like Deadbolt on the right-hand side. So just by looking at the ransoms, I can get a sense of what their tactics probably are, okay? So again, you can do this heat map, you can do this distance to say, how is their frequency of operation or frequency of ransom paid similar to the frequency or operation of another group? Which gives me a way of guessing that this group might be the same group rebranded statistically. And they don't have complete control over it because the victims pay the ransoms. So they can't change this until they change the rest of the victim behavior. So it's something that we can keep statistically track of even when they change tactics and rebrand themselves, all right? It's not geographically homogenous. The risk is not the same to you in the US as it is in Japan, as it is in you know any other country in the world, Ireland, right? So I hate this, it's difficult, it makes pricing the insurance products that I work on really hard, but it's interesting. And it also means when you go out as police officers or law enforcement and work on your MLATs, you gotta keep in mind that another country might not be experiencing the risk at the same level as you are. So when you're negotiating that and they don't understand what you're on about, maybe this has something to do with it. There's regional variation in time. You can see this, ransomware actors are moving east. We like to say risk is moving east more generally, and you can see it here. They're starting to target Japan, they're starting to target Korea, Singapore, other places. It's not just the US anymore. It used to be, um, but it's not. Frequency is increasing, but there are also slow periods. Turns out ransomware people go on holiday too. And you can get a sense of when they go on holiday, and I'm gonna show you some of that. It's gonna be cool. So you can see here peaks and troughs, and you can maybe even start to guess, like when's a good time to go on holiday as an incident responder? Um, right after you've taken them down is the answer, so work on that. Um, but moving on, there's variation in the frequency as well. So you can see, uh, you can compare this either in a country sense or in the um, ransomware gang sense. So the, so the counts by individual gangs, and one of the things I want you to take away is it's a heavily skewed uh, kind of set of numbers, right? It used to be Conti, um, Lockbit has now uh, risen above them, but this is kind of over a longer period of time. Um, the point being that the two biggest gangs take up most of the victims. You take down the big, big gangs, you make a big impact, right? Um, and then the victim count by country, unsurprisingly, the United States. The problem with a lot of these statistics is that they don't normalize by the population of those places. And that's dangerous. You need to think about that when you start to turn this into risk. Risk is not homogenous by sector or industry. You know that. You saw from other people's graphs. You've seen similar graphs today. My point is this is always changing over time, and it's actually different by different gang as well. Different gangs deliberately target different things. So you've seen some gangs say, we don't target healthcare. Me and my team sometimes sit down and think, did they actually live up to that statement? And that particular group did. Um, so it's interesting to see when they say, we won't target Russian infrastructure, we won't target this particular country, do they live up to that? We can also guess how many people paid. We have two or three different methods to do that. This one was pioneered by Trend Micro. So they have estimated how many people paid Conti in that you know two years of campaign time, August 2020 to April 2022. So the green on the bottom is the people who paid. And the blue is the people who did not pay. I'm going to hammer that point home. Remember, we're trying to get to hope. We're trying to go from ransomware to hope. It's a really tough job, and I'm trying to do my best for you. But we're going to get there. Even the payment rate, so how many people pay or don't pay, changes by geography. Some countries are more willing to pay than others. Maybe they're more capable of paying for other, paying because of you know the amount of money they have or whatever. But the payment rate varies by geography. Now, that suggests to me that you could go out to individual sectors and individual countries and do an intervention and say, hey, this country is more likely to pay than this country. Maybe we should have some regulator chats in that country and work on something. Or this sector is more likely to pay than that sector. Guess which sector is most likely to pay? This is where it gets fun. Come on, shout out. Which industry is most likely to pay a ransom? Insurance? I knew somebody would say that. So it's a fair, it's a fair criticism, but it's not the insurance sector. Lawyers. Just saying. Um, I'll show you proof of that in a minute. The risk even varies by time of day. So this is, again, Bitcoin payments. This is how much more you can squeeze the data you've got. This, all the data in the blockchain is UTC. And so you can take the payment time 
and skew it across like a decade and then say what time of day are most ransoms paid. And you can see that that graph has heavily shifted to the right over the, the past decade because it was mostly the US and uh, Europe making those payments. But it's more fun to animate this over time, which I haven't done here. Um, but you can see how that's changing over time. So, so risk is not homogenous by country, by sector. Um, it's not even homogenous by different gangs or by size of business. Um, and it's not even homogenous in time. It's dynamic. So try and get your head around that. I'll show you some more examples. So if you look at detections, this, this table is kind of hard to read, but what I want you to see is you've got enterprise businesses, um, small and medium enterprises and consumers down at the bottom, right? And then you've got which the, you know, top 10 uh, gangs hitting different countries. But what you see is that the number of times different organizations are hit does get impacted by the size of those organizations. Larger organizations are getting hit more often. All right. Now, if you're not confused yet, it's because you're not paying attention. Ransomware is seasonal. This is the seasonality of ransomware. So this is the number of ransom payments by day of the year with 10 years of data and 95% confidence intervals, all right? Ransomware hits you in the summer, mostly. And there are particular days that are worse than others. So a lot of summertime operations, also some winter operations right before Christmas. They love to hit e-payment sites, shopping, Black Friday, you get the idea. But it is seasonal, and I don't think that most people expect that. So take your holidays soon. Next year's summer is going to be tough. Um, I told you I love Deadbolt. Why do I love Deadbolt? They did this awesome thing where they put individual Bitcoin addresses inside the ransom notes, and the ransom notes are on the front page of these uh, network storage devices. And you can scan those, and you can get all the Bitcoin addresses of all the victims and see how many of them paid. Remember I promised you some good news? So I made a survival analysis graph here that I think is really cool. This is the proportion of people who paid that individual campaign. So I think this was 8,000 victims. And 8% of them paid. 8% of them paid. That's not that many. And it was $3,000 for this particular campaign. And then the, the curve there you see is how long it took them to pay and a little bit about variation of the number of days. But it's really tight. So the main point I want to make here is that most people who pay, pay really, really quickly. And then people just stop paying. They've restored their devices. They don't care. They've figured out a workaround or they've given up on the data or whatever. So if you can delay people from paying and get them thinking about it, they're less likely to pay. But still, more importantly, only 8% of people are paying. Do you see that in the news? No, you don't. You see the ransom was 40 million and super scary and it took down critical infrastructure. You don't see that only 8% of people are paying. All right. This is the financial infrastructure graph. So basically, how long do payments keep going to a collection of bit Bitcoin or Bitcoin Cash addresses. And you can see that this curve, like the modern trend is that they only use a, a single address for a single transaction and they don't survive very long. But the older gangs, they kept their Bitcoin addresses going for a little, little longer, actually a lot longer, right? Does anybody want to make a guess when the last WannaCry payment was made? <laughs> Good guess. <laughs> Not far off. Um, it was June. Yeah. But they're still getting paid. The wallet addresses are still receiving money. Um, and it's the right amount of money, you know, in terms of what the ask was. All right. We've heard about cost of access. We've talked about initial access brokers, but we haven't really thought about that from an economic perspective. If I buy access to your system for $40,000, I don't want to ransom you for less than that. Otherwise, I've lost money, right? They've got to make money too. It's an operation. That's how it works. So the lower bound of the ransom, if they've paid 40000 in this particular case, is going to be 40000 Two weeks later, they're like, oh, yeah, we we're, we're going to charge you 500000 That's the ransom after they bought you for 40000 It's just economics. But then that gets negotiated down or maybe somebody doesn't pay it. So these guys have to, they have to speculate on whether or not you're actually going to pay. And that's a weak point. And I want us to mindfully push on that weak point as a team as we go forward. So... You can also see uh, here the proportion. Remember I said lawyers? Remember that earlier? Anyone still awake? Um, here it is. It's lawyers. So the legal profession on the top and the, the payment rate, 20% of lawyers actually pay up. It's hard for me to read on this lower screen, so I'm going to step over here. So 19% of media and entertainment uh, organizations pay, 18% of hospitality, 15% of financial, 14% uh, of IT. You get the idea, right? All right, now I'm going to tell you some, some weird statistics, mind-blowing, I think. You'll probably go, no way, can't be true. 
All right? I'll start this story by saying I hate that people use averages to talk about ransom payments. I hate it so much, I wrote an entire academic paper about it. Averages do not characterize ransoms. They are heavy-tailed. They are skewed. They're very heavily skewed, so heavily skewed that the thing I'm about to show you is actually true. It doesn't seem like it can be true, but it is true. It seems wrong, right? It seems like that cannot be true. But 92% of ransoms in the data that I've been studying are below the average. 92% of them, right? And, you know, for those of you who don't do this all the time and think, like, that just doesn't sound right, I'm going to walk you through it. This is how this works, right? This is the, the simplistic example. You've got a list on the top. You've got nine ones in the list and one ten. You add those up. See, I'm not doing what Jaya did. I'm not making you do this yourself. I did it for you, <laughs> all right? Because I know it's the end of the day. I always feel smarter every time I come out of one of Jaya's talks, but she does, she does push it. So 19, and then we divide that by the 10 items in the list, and you get an average of 1.9, right? But nine items in this list are one, and they are less than 1.9. That's exactly what's going on back here when I say 92% of ransoms are below average. So keep that in mind. All right, and then... Final statistic. In the work that I was doing with Trend Micro, fantastic team, we were looking at estimating for each individual gang what the percentage of payment was, and then we're estimating that all up together. It's not as high as you think. 16% of people are paying ransoms. Only 16%. Now, there's some good news and some bad news because the gangs are making more money. And that means that if you're paying the ransom, you know, essentially the rich 1% are paying the ransoms and everybody else is suffering. They're subsidizing the victimization of everybody else when they pay those ransoms, right? We need a theory of change that is way beyond make backups. I would like to see traceability of transactions. I'd like to talk about infrastructure policing. We don't like using block lists, but you know, if you can keep people from accessing payment sites, it has an impact. Um, there's some danger there because it also means they can't negotiate the ransom if it's a hospital. I don't do that stuff lightly, but it is important and it can be done. Micro perimeterization, I think, is important. Business process policies, um, negotiation, onion, deny listing. If you can, if you can figure that out. When you pay, you're paying to victimize other people. The point here is that there are a lot of things we can do to push on the risk model of the attackers. There's a lot of things that can go wrong for them. They can get caught when they're laundering the money. Their binaries cannot work. Their tools can get detected. There's a lot going on. That kill chain. We talk about the kill chain all the time. Just make it probabilistic and think about the entire world at the same time. Don't think about just one organization being awesome at defending themselves and leave everyone else to suffer for it. Right? If any of this has been interesting to you, if you wake up in the morning and think, I really like statistics and economics, um, I'm just kidding. We don't do this all the time. I do this. Other people in the group are law enforcement. Other people in the group are incident responders. Other people in the group are lawyers. One of the things we talk about is that everyone has different reasons and ways to fight ransomware. So the police, what's their job? Is to catch the bad guy, right? The insurance industry might sometimes maybe help the victim a little bit. People complain that it never pays for the whole incident. I've got a clue for you because I work in the insurance industry now. I don't know how I ended up there. I obviously did something wrong to somebody in my past. But the point is, insurance is never supposed to pay for the entire incident. It's always supposed to pay for a small price. If we paid for everything, you guys would just go out and do bad stuff and we'd pay for it. It's a, it's, it's a misaligned incentive, as we say. So ransomware is only ever going to get 10% of the, the cost paid by the insurance industry. So don't use your insurance policy as your ransomware response. It's never going to be enough money, ever, right? And yes, I'm still pissed off at the insurance industry that I work in for paying ransoms. So these are the other people who are involved in this presentation. I think it's really important that you give them a round of applause. I'm a bit of a jerk, so don't applause for me. If you liked this presentation, it's because they were great. If you didn't like it, it's my fault. Um, do you have any questions? Are you just done and ready to drink? Looks like we have one question. I'll be super quick. Uh, it's two questions. One, how many lawyers are on the team? <laughs> uh, and um, of the lawyers, you know, 20% paying ransom, is that paying directly because they were hit or paying because they're paying on behalf directly of the because they were hit they were the victim in that particular case it's not like like of course lawyers are involved in every ransomware negotiation so it's a, it's a well-motivated question like you're basically saying 
do they are they just always involved in it because they're lawyers checking to see that sanctions aren't being violated or something? No, these were these were legal services um, firms that were hit with ransomware and chose to pay. And you had a second question. Okay, uh, in the first sig or okay, all right. I don't understand jokes. I'm from Cambridge. Um, <laughs> And it's kind of like a two-parter with two separate ones. Just on, with Monero, have you noticed loads of trends with crime and people using Monero as their network now as, as opposed to, say, Bitcoin or Ethereum or something under? Because people can you know, chart tracing Bitcoin and Monero still hasn't been cracked yet. Yes. Yeah, yeah. It's a great and well-motivated question. There are threat actors trying to get people to pay in Monero. They'll offer sometimes as much as a 20% discount to pay in Monero instead of Bitcoin or Bitcoin Cash. There are other actors that use Dash, for example. So not everyone uses Bitcoin. But the thing that makes Bitcoin uh, still very important is the amount of liquidity. Mm -hmm. You know, the problem with being like, let's say you're a huge company. Let's say you're a $100 million company. And typically these groups will charge you a ransom that's about 5% of your annual returning revenue. And the cost of the incident, to the best of our current estimation, is usually 40 to 60% of your annual returning revenue. So easy business model. But um, the point that I'm trying to make is that let's say your ransom was 5% ask at $100 million. Mm -hmm. You need to find $5 million really, really quickly. Monero doesn't necessarily have that kind of liquidity and it doesn't have the adoption in the exchanges where you can just go up and get the Bitcoin. You have to keep in mind a lot of these organizations don't know how to buy Bitcoin at all. And so they have to go and hire someone to do that, which is why those negotiating firms end up making a lot of money, right? Well, strictly speaking, they don't because only 16% of people are paying. So there's a huge business model here for all of the people who are not paying. And I encourage you to go and work and help them. Next Thank question. You. Sorry, I thought there was two there too. I'm really bad at math. Like, what's going on? Or math? I think you're good. No? All right. I'll let you go drink. Thank you for listening. Thank you.